I have a few letters here to a pastor from uh, different uh, children. And uh, the first one says, I know God loves everybody, but he's never met my sister. <laughs> Yours sincerely, Arnold. Dear Pastor, please say in your sermon that Peter Peterson has been a good boy all week. I am Peter Peterson. Dear Pastor, my father should be a minister. Every day he gives us a sermon about something. <laughs> Dear Pastor, I would like to go to heaven someday because I know my brother will not be there. <laughs> Dear Pastor, please pray for all airline pilots. I'm flying to California tomorrow. Laura, age 10. Dear Pastor, please say a prayer for our Little League team. We need God's help or a new pitcher. Thank you. Dear Pastor, are there any devils on the earth? I think there might be one in my class. Carla. Anyway, hopefully you enjoyed those. <laughs> And if you have your Bible open, get it out, and we'll uh, start in Luke's Gospel today. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What is interesting is that we have four Gospels, and you may have wondered why there are four. And the answer is that each one of them give us a different portrait of Christ and all four gives us a, a nice clear picture of who he is. Matthew presents Christ as a king. And we find in that wonderful book of Matthew things that pertain to the fact that Christ would one day rule over Israel and over the whole earth as king of kings and lord of lords. And that's why you have the genealogy there of Joseph and of the kingly line and the fact that uh, the wise men come and ask where is he that is born king of the Jews. And uh, so this book all the way through focuses on things that relate to Christ being king. Mark's gospel presents Christ as a servant. And you'll find in Mark's gospel there's no record of the birth of Christ at all. Because it doesn't really matter uh, about a servant's birth. All you really focus on is, does he serve and does he serve well? And you'll see lots of the works of Christ presented in Mark's gospel. He was God's servant. Then in Luke's gospel, Christ is presented as a man. And that's why the genealogy takes us all the way back to Adam. And we see the birth of Christ. And that's where the baby is born. And, and that takes place in a stable in Bethlehem and the baby is laid there in the manger. But the birth is not really recorded in Matthew as the wise men came two years late. The birth had already occurred and they came to a house and found uh, Mary and Joseph and the, the young child Jesus living in a home in Bethlehem. They did not come to the stable. And so the things that deal with the humanity of Christ, the fact that he is a man, are presented in Luke's gospel. Then John's gospel presents Christ as God. And again, there is no record of the birth of Christ in John's gospel because God has no birthday. He has no father or mother, no beginning, no ending. And so God has eternally existed, and that's the way the book begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and so on. So these four gives us a, a beautiful picture of who Christ is, each painting a different portrait. That's why they differ, each one focusing on different aspects of the person of Christ. And in Luke's Gospel, of course, we have the humanity of Christ, the fact that Christ would be God who would take on human flesh. Let's look in Luke chapter 2 and verse 1 as we probably have read the story before, 
But it says it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. Now, how did the Caesar in Rome get involved in this story? Well, the answer is Mary and Joseph lived in Nazareth. And the prophet Micah had foretold the birth would take place in Bethlehem. So how do we get Mary and Joseph in Bethlehem just in time to have the baby born? Well, God uses a ruler halfway around the world to make a decree that seemed somewhat unreasonable and shook up the world at that time. Everybody was placed on the road and had to travel and be a part of the census and give their taxes. And so Mary and Joseph had to leave Nazareth and make the difficult journey about a hundred miles to the south to Bethlehem. Remember, they didn't have the interstate. They didn't have uh, uh, the convenience of the travel we have today. They either walked or had to use a donkey. And it was uh, rough terrain. Oftentimes, robbers would rob you on the way. So generally, they would travel together with others so that they had some kind of protection or defense as they went. But God used a man halfway around the world to bring about this move to Bethlehem so that she would be there, so the prophecy would be fulfilled. Hold your place here. Let's go back to the Old Testament for just a moment and take a look with me at Isaiah. And we find here that Isaiah uh, tells, I believe, about this very event back here hundreds of years before it ever occurred. Isaiah, turn if you will, and I'll give you the page number whenever I get there. And let's see here. This is going to be Isaiah, and it'll be chapter 46. And notice, if you will, what God says here, beginning in verse 8. Isaiah, chapter 46, beginning in verse 8. He says, remember this and show yourselves men. Bring it again to mind, O ye transgressors. He's talking here to a bunch of hostile listeners that apparently need convincing that God's word is true. And notice he says here in verse 9, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is what? None like me. What a great verse that is. And you see that repeated numerous times throughout the Bible. There is only one God, and he says here, there is none like me. You know, today we have, especially in our universities, uh, we have courses called comparative religions where you study the world religions and they throw in Christianity as just one more of the world religions. But you can't compare them because the Bible and the God of the Bible doesn't even fit in the same ballpark with the world religions. And obviously... Uh, it's a mismatch. And it's interesting here that God talks about that uniqueness about himself and about his word long before even Christ ever comes and demonstrates to us how that he is unique. He says in verse 5, To whom will you liken me and make me what? Equal. Now that's what happens in these religion courses. They're all made equal. Have you noticed? And then it says, And compare me. So Christianity is compared with all the religions of the world that we may be like. God is saying, you can't do that with me. He says in verse 9, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. You can't 
put me into the same mix with the world religions. All religions are man-made. All religions will take you to hell. You can choose any religion you want and you will find it ultimately will take you to hell. The Bible is the opposite of religion. The word religion comes from two Latin words, re and ligio, and it means to do something of self to bind back to God. And the common denominator of all the religions of the world is that you have to work your way to heaven. And there's the Christian counterfeit that is also in that collection of uh, false groups and religions where men try to work their way to heaven. I happened to turn on the TV last night and I scanned the Christian uh, television channel, which is probably the unchristian channel. Uh, the guy on there giving a message last night said, what would you give to receive the gift of God? And the whole message was on how much you'd have to give to get God's gift. I thought, how crazy. How can you give to get a gift? If you have a gift, there's nothing you give. It's no strings attached. He talked about how uh, the wise men had to give up a lot of their personal time from their jobs or their occupations. And they had to uh, travel a long journey and, and look at what they gave up in the way of conveniences. And and so on and so on. And he listed all the things that the wise men gave up so they could get the gift of God. Amazing. I mean, how wrong can you get? And it seemed like yesterday when I was scanning, it was a full-out attack on Christianity on almost every channel. Uh, MSNBC kept running the Gospel of Judas. Now, Judas couldn't possibly have written that. It was written in the 4th century, unless he came back from the dead to write it. He certainly didn't write it, you know, between uh, betraying Christ and then having remorse and casting the, the uh, coins back down into the temple and then finding his way out to a tree to hang himself. Uh, he didn't have much time. But it's, it's totally false and, and, and presents Christ as just being a man, tells that it was a plot that Jesus... Uh, put uh, Judas up to that so he could die so he could be released from this body he was in that he didn't want to be in anymore and it's just absolute nonsense and uh, and then on uh, CNN they had the life of Christ and on that program they called Jesus Saint Jesus Jesus is God when did he get demoted to a saint and that doesn't make any sense at all here is Jesus who's God and they present him simply as a saint. I didn't see anything that really had much very accurate. They had some historian at the Louvre in Paris, France and he said uh, four times that he was there at the Louvre. The first time I thought it was just a slip of the tongue. The second time I said he's really saying Louvre. The third and fourth time I said he doesn't know what he's talking about. I think he was at a Venetian blind factory <laughs> where they made louvers and not the museum, the Louvre in, in Paris. What a crazy, crazy day of television. Everything had to be all jumbled up and <clears throat> if I were watching and didn't know what I knew, I would say, well, forget it. Who knows uh, what is truth and is the Bible true and so on. And I would uh, just probably say, ah, uh, just another religious belief out there. But notice God makes it different here. He says, I am not the same. You can't compare me to the world religions. You, by the way, none of the world religions provide a savior. In Islam, there's no savior. You're on your own. And look out. Chances are that you've got a dismal future ahead of you. And in Buddhism, there is no savior. You're on your own. In Hinduism, there's no savior, you're on your own. In Confucianism, there's no savior, you're on your own. They're all based on works and, and one day you're just going to have to hope that you had enough good works to, to get in. Well, God says here, listen, be a man, start thinking like a man. Verse 9, remember the former things of old. I am God, verse 9 of Isaiah 46, and there is none else, and I am God, and there is what? None like me. 
So right there, just pitch everything else out because they don't even compare. He says, who are you going to compare me to? There's nothing that you can compare me to. Somebody once said that the writings of the world religions, when compared to the Bible, just as literature, the difference is so vast, it's the same as the difference between reading Bugs Bunny and Shakespeare. There's no comparison. The Bible is far beyond the world religions as their writings contain contradictions, scientific errors, but the Bible is never wrong, but yet tells the future. Look, if you will, at verse 10 here. God says, who can do this? All right, let's see who's going to step up to the plate when you try to compare me to the world religions. Declare the end. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are what? Not yet done. None of the world religions do that. They cannot tell the future. This book, the Bible, tells the future hundreds and even thousands of years in advance and tells that Jesus would be born of a virgin in the city of Bethlehem, that this would be God who would take on flesh and talked about two comings. And in the second coming, he'd be king and rule over this earth. Look at what it says here. And it says here, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Verse 11, calling a ravenous bird from the east, the man that executeth my counsel from a far country. Interesting, perhaps a reference to the Caesar who makes a decree that shakes up the world, but what really took place was that Mary and Joseph had to move to Bethlehem. God used a man halfway around the world to pull that off. It says, yea, in verse 11, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it. I will also do it. It doesn't say maybe. It doesn't say perhaps. It doesn't say it might happen. It says, this is what I said. This is what I purposed. This is what's going to happen. This is what I'm going to do. And that's exactly what happens. Verse 12, God, I think, has got a sense of humor. He says, hearken unto me, you stout-hearted. Now, in modern English, that would read, hearken unto me, or listen unto me, you fatheads. <laughs> God says, listen, pay attention here. Uh, hearken unto me, you fatheads, that are far from what? Far from the truth, far from righteousness. Uh, they were far from ever entering into heaven. They needed to pay attention to this book being unique, and that God, the God of this book, is unique. Let's go over to the previous chapter of Isaiah. Notice who the God of the Bible is. In verse 18 it says, For thus saith the Lord that created the heavens, 45.18, God himself that formed the earth and made it, he hath established it, he created it not in vain, he formed it to be inhabited. Now look at the end of verse 18. God says here in Isaiah 40. 518, I am the Lord, and there is what? None else. I hope you mark it. And then he says in verse 19, I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I haven't kept any secrets. I have told you what I was going to do, and I tell you in advance. In fact, he says, you who are listening, who know the truth, need to tell others, which is what witnessing is all about. Verse 20, assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, you that are escaped of the nations, you that have found the truth. They have no knowledge that set up, notice, the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that what? Cannot save. He's talking here about all the world religions. They cannot save. If you're marking your Bible, I've marked cannot save. Religion can't save you. You can choose any religion you want. They'll all take you to hell. They're all based on man working his way toward heaven, which is impossible. The Bible teaches that God does for man what man could not do for himself, and that salvation according to the Bible is provided by God through Christ's death at Calvary, and it's not what we do for God that saves us, which is what religion teaches but it's what God did for us at Calvary through Christ. 
Verse 21. Tell ye, bring them near. Let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? God has obviously told it beforehand. Who hath told you from that time? Have not I the Lord? Look at verse 21. Notice the end, verses, the end of that verse. There is no God else beside me, a just God and what? A Savior. There is none beside me. No Savior in any of the world religions. There is no other God. Only this God, the God of creation, Verse 18, the one who created the heavens and the earth. Verse 22 says, Look unto me, and be ye what? Saved. If you want to be saved, I'm the one you have to turn to. Don't turn to any of the religions of this world. They cannot save. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God. And what does it say? And there is none else. How many times do we have to say that? You know, I'm God and there's none else. There's none like me. He is the only God and the only Savior. And then it says here, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. In other words, it's saying here, God will never change his mind. What God has spoken will never be taken back. You and I talk to people who will change their mind and take their words back, won't they? Why, I promised to do such and such for you. Next time you meet them, they said, I never said that. I never promised I would do that. And they renege on their word and they take their word back. God isn't going to do that. God doesn't change his mind. He doesn't say, yeah, I told you I'd save you if you trust Christ, but I I take my word back and I'm not going to do that. You're you're on your own. No, he, he'll never do that. We can have confidence to know that whatever God has said is said in concrete. That it's gone forth. He'll never retract his words. He'll never revise his words. He'll never change his words. They're there forever and ever. And if you didn't realize that that book you have in your hand, not necessarily that copy, is going to be a long, around a long time after this world is gone. Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away but my words shall never pass away. Peter said, The word of God liveth and abideth forever. This book is going to be around after this earth has been destroyed, after the thousand year reign of Christ. And then notice it says here in uh, verse uh, 23, My word has gone forth out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall swear. And surely shall one say, In the Lord have I righteousness. There's salvation. How are we able to be eligible to enter into heaven? We have to be as righteous as God. And notice the Bible gives us that wonderful key right here in this verse. It says, Surely shall one say in that day, In the Lord have I righteousness. Our righteousness comes from God. He imparts or imputes his righteousness to the believer. And it says, even to him shall men come. That's a reference to Christ. God in flesh, the only God and the only Savior. Now hold your place in Luke, but let's go now over to Philippians for just a moment. This passage is now quoted over in the book of Philippians. And Philippians is found after Ephesians and before Colossians. It probably doesn't help you much. Page 1259 is where we're going to go. But let's pick up on page 1258. Jesus Christ, according to the Bible, is God. And God says in Isaiah, I, even I, am God, and beside me there is no Savior, there is no other God but me, and there is none like me. And notice what it tells us about Christ here. In verse 6 of Philippians 2, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God. Jesus Christ is God in flesh. It says in verse 7, 
He's equal with God and existing eternally in the form of God. It says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And in verse 7, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. That's the Christmas story. Here we have God leaving heaven and becoming one of us, <laughs> except without sin. So God became us. You know, if you were the creator and ants were your creation, the best way to communicate with one of those ants would to become a little ant yourself and go down and wiggle feelers or whatever they do. I'll never forget in my college dorm, sometimes I'd open the wind window there in Murphy Hall in Gainesville and the winter it would be cool and somehow there would be an ant trail coming across my my desk and so I found that static electricity really does affect those little ants and so I would take my comb and I'd do a couple of these and I'd hold it over the ant and sometimes they would just be taken right off the desk and catch onto your comb. But when you did it a second time, they would grip onto that desk. You see their little bodies extended upward. I'm revealing another part of me now. Look out. But I found out that their little feelers, or whatever they are out there, their antennae, would go straight up. And after I did this a couple of times, their antenna seemed to stay up. It seemed like they lost direction because they, they needed those things down here to kind of find their way around. But you know, I couldn't communicate with them and say, look, stay off my desk. <laughs> I. Uh, uh, had the problem that you have and I all people have I guess with ants you have to exterminate them or something because they're going to cross wherever there might be food in any case God became one of us so he could communicate with us and that's what it's saying here that here is Jesus Christ who comes and becomes of no reputation takes upon himself the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men verse 8 and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And so Jesus Christ is God who in a human body goes to the cross and dies. Now look at verse 9. This is the verse you want to see. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That name is Jesus. There is no name higher in position or authority than the name of Jesus. It is a combination of God's name, which in the Hebrew is four consonants, Y-H-W-H, which we pronounce as Jehovah or Yahweh. Nobody's really sure how to pronounce his name because for so long they didn't pronounce it and there are no vowel sounds and no pronunciation marks to let us know. But Yahweh is the popular pronunciation. The second word, Yasha, Y-A-S-H-A, connected to that, the contraction is Yeshua. And Yeshua means Yahweh the Savior. And that occurs in the Old Testament over 130 times. You could put equivalent in the margin, Jesus. Because the English form of Yeshua is Jesus. So Jesus is throughout the Old Testament. It's God himself. And that name, the name of Jesus, God says he's exalted above every name. So there is no name higher to call upon than the name of Jesus. And then he goes on to say in verse 10 that at the name of Jesus, or Yeshua, every knee should bow. That's a reference to Isaiah 45 where we just were. Of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is 
Now that, if you notice the margin there in your Schofield, it points out Isaiah 45, 22, where there it is Yahweh or Jehovah that is speaking, Lord in all capitals in that verse back there, letting us know it's God's own personal name, the one that created the universe, the one that not, did not keep things in secret, the one that told his plans in advance and beforehand, the one who told those who had escaped being blinded and had found the truth to assemble everybody else and tell them this wonderful news that if they would look unto me, God said, I'll save you, for I am a just God and a Savior. And here we find that it says that Jesus is that God who is that Savior. And one day every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Yahweh or Jehovah to the glory of God the Father. So what it's saying here is that one day everybody will confess with their lips that Jesus Christ is God, the God that we just read about in Isaiah, and everybody will be on their knees and worship Him. But for those in hell, it'll be too late. So I like to tell people, when would you like to believe on Christ, now or later? You want to trust Him now? and then be assured of going to heaven when you die? Or do you want to acknowledge who he is when you're in hell when it's too late? Because one day, everybody will be a believer. Everybody in hell believes Jesus Christ is the Savior and believes he's the God of the Old Testament. Never forget, young Air Force man, I told him about Christ. I was trying to witness to him and he said, get away with that stuff. I don't want to hear another word. Leave me alone said, fine, I'll leave you alone, but just don't stop breathing. The moment you stop breathing, you'll be a believer. And I walked away. He said, come back. What do you mean by that? And I told him that everybody, once they die, will recognize who Christ is. They'll believe in hell. They'll be there. And they'll be separated from God forever and ever. The Jehovah's Witnesses reject Christ. Guess what? One day they will confess with their mouth that He is Jesus, He is God, and they'll bow their knee and worship Him in hell forever. Of course, they don't believe in hell, but guess what? They're going to believe in hell. They'll believe in heaven. They'll believe in the Bible. They'll believe in all these things. But then it'll be too late. That's who Jesus is. Let's go back down to Luke chapter 1, and we have here in the story... A decree made by a Roman Caesar halfway around the world. And in our story, we find that it causes Mary and Joseph to start moving to Bethlehem. What if the decree had not been made? Mary and Joseph would have remained in Nazareth, the child would have been born in the wrong city. The prophecy would have been wrong, the Bible would be an error, and we might as well pitch it all out. The amazing thing about this book is it's so interwoven, the prophecies, the fulfillment, and the fact that all of them have to come to pass, and they have to come back to pass literally. This proves this book to be the Word of God. God says, listen uh, to what I have to say. I declare the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things that are not yet done saying, my counsel will stand, and what I say, and I have purposed, will take place. So we find here, verse 4 of Luke 2, Joseph also went up from Galilee. Verse 3 had said, everyone went to their own city, and Joseph went up to the city from which he was descended, which was Bethlehem. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, unto Judea, as the region around Jerusalem, where the tribe of Judah uh, settled, and it was called Judea. Under the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. That's where David had been born. And it's called Bethlehem. And by the way, Bethlehem means house of bread. The word Beth in Hebrew means house. If you have a synagogue and you pass, well, there's one in Tampa, I think, called Beth Israel. It means house of Israel. Or 
the temple may be Beth Shalom. It would mean house of peace. Bethlehem means house of bread. And isn't it interesting that Jesus, who said, I am the bread of life, came out of the city that means house of bread. Christ came forth from this city to bring bread to all those that would partake of him where they'd live forever. Because, notice verse 4, he was of the house and lineage of what? David. He had to go back to Bethlehem because he was of that lineage of David and that's where David came out of Bethlehem. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being what? Great with child. In other words, she was very close to delivering that baby. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. So they made this journey and notice the difficulty here. A woman in the last months of her pregnancy and she has to make a hundred mile journey over mountainous territory at peril to robbers and uh, everything else that could happen and she's almost ready to deliver that child. And notice that she arrives there just in time. Verse 7, she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because <clears throat> there was no room for them in the inn. It doesn't say that they couldn't afford a room in the inn. It says there was no room in the inn. So when they got there, no vacancy, no vacancy, no vacancy wherever they looked. And so the only place left available was the stable. And notice she wraps that baby in swaddling clothes. If you look down to verse 12, when the shepherds were told how to find this baby, it says in verse 11, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, verse 11, <clears throat> which is Christ the Lord, verse 12, And this shall be a sign unto you, you shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes. Most of the babies born were probably in pampers, or Huggies or the other different brands. But this was unique. <clears throat> you know, what's interesting about swaddling clothes is that these are the narrow linen strips used in <clears throat> embalming someone. You say, why in the world would you wrap your baby in the clothes you would embalm a, child, a, a, a dead body with? This was a picture of Christ's death from the, from the get-go. This child was born to die as our Savior. And so he was wrapped in swaddling clothes. You wouldn't found any other baby wrapped that way. But Christ was wrapped in swaddling clothes. I didn't learn that until my first trip to Israel, Well, where I learned so many things about the geography and the customs. Uh, and and I, I learned that swaddling clothes, and you can certainly do your homework and find that out. But uh, this is how Jesus was wrapped. Because he was born to die. And it was a picture of his death even in his birth. So here in verse 8, there were in the same country <coughs> shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. Even to this very day, just outside of Bethlehem are fields where shepherds watch their flocks. Several of you have been to Israel with me and you've been with me in those fields. And here they were watching their flocks. Verse 9, And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to, notice it says, all people. This wasn't a message just for a handful, or even just for the nation of Israel. This was a nation for, a, rather a message for all the nations and all the people on the planet Earth. And then it says, and here's the message, that unto you is born this day in the city of David a what? A Savior. We just read in Isaiah, God says, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. He says in Isaiah 45 that I am a just God and a Savior. There's only one Savior. And God is that Savior. And he reveals how he would come to take on flesh, born of a virgin in Bethlehem. And here we find that Jesus Christ is God. Notice, he's a savior. Secondly, he's Christ. That means he's the Messiah, the one predicted that would come by the, by the uh, 
prophets. Thirdly, he is the Lord. That means he's God. And then it says, this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the baby wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. What's interesting here is that there's no star. There's no wise men. That happened two years later. The wise men and the shepherds never met. The wise men didn't come to the stable. In Matthew, they came to a house. They didn't find a baby in lying in a manger, but they found a young growing child about two years of age. Verse 13, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God. And what's interesting here is most people think that they sing. And we've learned that, I think, from all the hymns. There's not a reference anywhere in the Bible that angels sing. If they do, it's not recorded in Scripture. But notice it says here, this host of the heavenly host praising God and what? Saying, not singing. And they say what? Glory to God in the highest on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. This event would have brought peace to the whole earth had Christ been received as the Messiah of Israel. But because Christ was rejected, that peace was postponed. And Christ will come again. And this next time, he'll bring peace on earth. And there will be goodwill toward men. But that was postponed. Then it says in verse 15, It came to pass as the angels were gone away. No wings, no female angels, no baby angels, no angels singing. They're all male angels. A lot of people are totally shocked to find out just that little bit about angels, but they uh, don't have wings. It came to pass as the angels were gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said one to another, let us now go even unto Bethlehem and see this thing which has come to pass. Notice the faith of these shepherds. They didn't say, let's go and see if it came to pass. They said, let us go and see this thing which is come to pass. They believed it which the Lord hath made known unto us. And so they believed that that message came directly from the Lord. And they came with haste. They hurried and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they had seen, they made known abroad the saying which was told them concerning the child. What is interesting is that how we've gotten away from what really happened here in the biblical story. It doesn't say in verse 17 when they had seen that they said, let's go out to Walmart and let's buy gifts and we'll wrap them and distribute them. It doesn't say anything about uh, giving gifts at all. It says here, they said, let's uh, go abroad and they said, that, uh, and, and they said, let's make known the saying which was told concerning the child. And of course, what they told was that this was a savior this was the Messiah, and this was, of course, God. And uh, that was the first Christmas, and it was very simply observed. Here was God who came and took on human flesh. Well, Jesus Christ is God, and he came, and uh, obviously he impacted the whole world. Think about it right now. All around the world, people are aware that Christmas is being celebrated. That's pretty significant in itself, isn't it? Did you know that your newspaper this morning declares that Christ was here 2,000 years ago? The date on there is dated from Christ coming here the first time. Did you know that your check is not valid unless you testify that Jesus was here 2,000 years ago by putting the date on there that says Jesus was here 2,000 years ago. Try to buy something, a piece of property or an automobile or anything else. Your contract is not legal unless you give testimony to the fact that Jesus Christ was here 2,006 years ago. And you have to put that date on there. Leave the date off and what happens? It doesn't work. You got to have it there. And so every day we give testimony to the fact that this Jesus came into the world 
and the whole world has been impacted by his coming. And we can't escape it, can we? All history is centered around Jesus. All history before Christ is B.C., before Christ. All history since Christ is A.D., which refers really from the Latin Anno Domino, the, the day or year of his birth. And so all history since Christ is A.D., since Christ's birth. Now some try to get away or around that because they don't want to acknowledge Christ. And so they say B.C.E., before common era. And then they say, of course, C.E. for since Christ, which is common era, E.R.A. But guess what? The dividing point is the same. I get a big chuckle out of that. You know, try their hardest to eliminate Jesus, and you can't because still B.C.E. and C.E. divide at the same point when Jesus came into this world. Obviously, he impacted the world like no other human being, but he's more than a human being. He is God. And his name has been exalted above all names. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the God of the Bible. Maybe he'll give you more boldness when you witness to somebody. When would you like to acknowledge who Christ is? Now? Or later? What do you mean? Well, in hell, everybody believes in Christ, but it's too late. You want to wait till then? Or would you rather accept him as your savior now and, and go to heaven? Certainly, that's the, what the Bible presents. And we believe that is certainly true. All the world religions are man-made, Satan-inspired, and none of them can save. But only the God of the Bible can save you. And Christ is, of course, that Savior. And the first Christmas was celebrated by those who learned of it telling about what they had heard. And the message was the message that this was a Savior, this was the Messiah, and this was the Lord God Himself. Anyway, that's what we celebrate tomorrow, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, you'll use the whole holiday which goes on for obviously quite a bit of time here to lead someone to Christ, to tell them the, the good news. And certainly they need it, don't they? I went to the mall yesterday. That was a mistake. <laughs> I got a sample of the spirit of Christmas in the parking lot. Patiently waiting, cars backing out, my turn signal's on, I'm ready to go in when he came out. He pulls out, and I see a car racing toward me, thought he was going to hit me. And I said, well, I better let him go on by. And he went, Whoo! stole my place. I said, this man must be a Christian. <laughs> he must know the Lord. And, uh, but... It was no better once I got into the mall. It was just absolutely everybody for themselves. Look out. And, uh, <clears throat> but I think most people don't know what Christmas is all about. I think they need to know. This is a great chance to be able to share the gospel while we uh, have that opportunity because Christ is coming the second time and I believe uh, very soon. And I think you must agree. Let me illustrate. I'm going to see if I can pull this off without dropping my Bible on the floor. And uh, clean piece of paper, that's what I was looking for. This hand, I'm going to let it represent everybody here. I'm going to let my hymnal represent sin. We're all sinners. God loves us, hates our sin, wants us to enter heaven. No sin can exist in the presence of God. If we paid for our sin, it would be hell. Our works will never pay for sin. So we really have got a problem here. What we need is a Savior. My other hand representing Christ, he is that Savior. And I'll let this clean piece of paper represent his righteousness, which in order to enter heaven, you'd have to be as righteous as God. We're not. But what happened at the cross was your sins, my sins, were taken and laid upon Christ, and he paid for them by his death. And he came back from the dead three days later to demonstrate that he was indeed who he claimed that he 
is. And the Bible tells us when we trust that he did that for us, God exchanges and credits our account over here with his righteousness. So the believer is seen as righteous as God. And at the moment you trust the Lord, that occurs. And from that moment on, you can be absolutely assured of going to heaven. That's got to be good news, and that's what it's all about. So the gift of eternal life is a gift that's received free from our, per, our part. We just simply receive it by trusting that God did it for us. Let's bow in prayer. With heads bowed, with eyes closed, with no one looking around, my friend, where would you go if you were to die? And if you didn't know when you came in to the meeting today, chances are maybe you've never trusted Christ. Maybe you've never understood the gospel. And uh, uh, this is your opportunity right now to get this thing settled between you and the living God. You can trust Christ and leave here absolutely assured of going to heaven whenever you would die because eternal life is God's gift and it's offered completely free to anyone that would receive it by trusting that Christ died for them and shed his blood to pay for your sins in full at the cross. What do you pray? What do you say? Just say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I don't understand a whole lot, but I believe, trust that Jesus Christ died for me. I believe he paid for my sins in full at the cross, was buried and rose again from the dead. I trust him right now as my Savior to forgive my sins, to give me the gift of eternal life. And the moment you do, God up in heaven will save you. Would you do that right now? God up in heaven has made every provision for you to go to heaven. If you reject it, then in reality, you're causing yourself to be eternally banished from the living God who wants you to be able to live in his presence and made provision so you could be forgiven and receive his gift of eternal life. I wouldn't turn it down if I were you. Just, Lord, I am a sinner. I don't understand a whole lot, but I believe Jesus died for me. I trust him right now as my Savior, as my only hope of heaven, and God will save you. If you're looking for a feeling, don't. We're never told in the Bible to ever look for a feeling. That can be misleading because feelings are up and down and you may not always feel the way you think you should to demonstrate that you're saved or not. And so that can be really disconcerting. Why not right now? Just take God at His word and say, if you said it, God, and I believe it, that settles it. And you can be assured that God is not going to take his word back or change his word or alter it or lie or trick you the moment you trust Christ God saves you how again just Lord I'm a sinner I don't understand much but I believe Jesus died and paid my sin debt in full was buried and rose again from the dead I trust him right now as my only hope of heaven and God will save you the moment you do that while heads are bowed and eyes are closed on purpose so that you'll not be put on the spot or embarrassed I'm going to close in prayer in just a moment. And while no one is looking, I'm going to ask in just a moment, not now, for you to let me know if you prayed this prayer and trusted Christ because I'd like to include you in my closing prayer. But no one's going to point you out. No one's going to come running up and grab you. No one's going to have you down the aisle. Uh, no one will even know except for me because I'm going to be the only one looking. But while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you prayed this prayer and trusted Jesus as your Savior right here in this meeting I'd like to have you let me know right now just lift up your hand where I can see it God bless you ma'am God bless you sir God bless you ma'am all right just you can put it back down are there any others I trusted Jesus Christ right here this morning God bless you all right anyone else I trusted Christ as my Savior I'd like to pray for you lift your hand let me see and then we're gonna quit anyone else that would say I too Prayed that prayer. I trusted Christ. All right, I see a, a child back here. All right, anybody else? All right, I think I saw three or four adults and at least one child. Lord, we do pray for these that just now indicated they trusted you as their Savior. Let them know that the story is true. It is confirmed by the accuracy of this book and, uh, and the fact that uh, this book tells us things that 
we could otherwise not know in advance of their happening. And they come to pass exactly like the Bible said that they would. And certainly, uh, Jesus Christ is the one who fulfilled all these incredible prophecies. And we see so many that we didn't cover and wouldn't have time to cover today that absolutely demonstrate without a doubt that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Lord, we pray for these that just trusted the Lord. Give them assurance. Let them know it's really true. Let them uh, get into the Bible and grow as a believer. Hopefully they'll feel welcome to come back here and learn and grow here at Calvary and serve here. We ask you to bless each one's Christmas. We pray that we might have a, a wonderful time of sharing and enjoying uh, as we think about what happened, as we read the scriptures and, and know the story. Uh, we pray for the service tonight, the candlelight service, that many might come and just take this time together to uh, remember you're coming into this world with the uh, Lord's Supper and with the candlelighting. It would be a precious time to bring in tomorrow. We ask you to bless now as we conclude. In Jesus' name, amen.